Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Have a good Sunday morning. Have a good 4th of July. It's the day that we celebrate our independence. I hear that um, in England they call it Happy Treason Day. What's such is life. Let us now do our call to worship found in the bulletins. Loving Christ, you are our gentle shepherd. We are your people, who to know your will, and to live in your way. Keep us safe and secure in your compassionate hands. We are your gentle shepherd, lead us as you lead paths of love and service. As you lead and guide us, touch our hearts and minds in this worship time.
peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us greet one another in the name of Christ our Lord.
we go now to Psalm 123. And we're staying in the Psalms of Ascent. And so they're, they're generally short. And as I say, there are some of Ascent, so we think that um, it is meant to be sung on, going on, on the steps going up into the temple. And you can sing this psalm, lifting your eyes to heaven. And this psalm starts out in the singular, but ends up in the plural. So pay attention to the pronouns. I lift up my eyes to you, to you who sit enthroned in heaven. As the eyes of slaves look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of the female slave look to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God, till he shows us mercy, and have mercy on us, Lord, have mercy on us, for we have endured no end of contempt. We have endured no end of ridicule from the arrogant, of contempt from the proud. And finally, we go over to Mark 6, verses 1 to 13. And Jesus, Jesus has been traveling around, and he comes to his home of 30 years. He receives a surprise there, and as well, he sends out the disciples, telling them something that they didn't expect. Hear now the words of Mark. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't he the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except to lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except the staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, Leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that the people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
But Jesus is not only Jesus the carpenter's son. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the anointed one. Who is he anointed by? God. But that means something special. Through the Christ, through the anointed one, all things are possible. With Christ, anything can happen. Anything. The Christ means that Emmanuel, God with us, is here. He will never leave or forsake us, and he wants us to grow closer day by day. What does that mean for us? Instead of expecting the expected, we should expect the unexpected. As a matter of fact, we should expect the miraculous. We should expect the impossible. We should expect Jesus to jump out of the shell, jump out of our expectations, and do what Jesus does. Jesus didn't simply teach that day in Nazareth. Jesus was God in Nazareth. And did you notice the end of this passage? He only laid hands on a few people and cured them. This was nothing that he hadn't done before. And this story is struck right between healing a demon-possessed man, the healing of a woman, the raising of a girl from the dead, and the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus was right in the middle of miracle load. He was indeed the Christ, and the text implies that he would have done more miracles if he wasn't in the hometown because people didn't expect him to do miracles. You know, when you think about it, maybe they didn't even want miracles. They wanted their life to go on as before. The people expected the same old Jesus that they were used to. The same old Jesus that they'd seen, seen around, that they'd seen in the shop, in the carpenter's shop, that they'd seen in the marketplace. They expected him to do the ordinary thing, the same old thing. But folks, the Christ is not the same old, same old. He is brand new, the miracle working Christ. Saying that Jesus did a few miracles is like saying that Warren Buffett and Bill Gates gave away a few bucks. I think that if the folks had more belief, he would have done more miracles. But the purpose of those miracles was to show people that he was indeed the Christ. So today, I stand up here and I say to you, expect the unexpected. If any of you have ever seen Big Brother, there are twists and turns in that television show, and their motto is expect the unexpected. Well, they stole that motto from Jesus. Have faith that Christ will perform something exceptional in your life. Trust that your faith is the kind of faith that Jesus wants, and I think that the Nazarenes couldn't get over their expectations, couldn't get over their preconceived notions. Generally, just like the folks in Nazareth, we will get no more than we expect. But the surprising thing in this passage is that Jesus was amazed by the people's lack of faith. He didn't expect that. He didn't expect them not to have faith in this hometown. It's my hope that around here, that's not the problem. It is my hope that around here, folks will have enough faith. Because faith implies trust, trust implies relationship. The people of Nazareth had a certain relationship with Jesus an expected relationship. I have no doubt that after he performed miracles, healed a few, someone came up and asked him if they could fix his chair leg. To the people outside of Nazareth, Jesus was an unknown quantity, so a few healings threw them for quite a loop. Are we like Jesus' hometown, or are we like Jesus, the people? 
who weren't from his town? Are we able to put our normal perceptions of Christ aside and see him with fresh eyes? Are we able to allow him in all the areas of our lives or just the areas where we expect him? Are we comfortable with our perceptions of how he fits? Or does he make us feel a bit uncomfortable? Is Christ meeting our expectations? Or are we willing to allow ourselves to be surprised? If you're uncomfortable with your perceptions of the Savior, it's time to get outside the box. If your relationship isn't a growing, evolving, surprising thing, then you need to change course. If you can't say, I can't wait to see how Jesus will change my life, then your life won't be changed by him. If you can't sing a new song, the old ones will get stale after a bit. We don't hear much about Nazareth in the Bible because they always thought of the Christ as a carpenter, not something new and different. The only time Nazareth is mentioned in the Bible after the Gospels is in reference to Jesus of Nazareth. Never for what the Nazarenes said or did or thought. They stuck to the same old ideas of who they thought Jesus should be. They never got with the program and perceived him as the Son of God, sent to change the destiny of the world and every person in it. It is my hope and prayer that we don't make that same decision. So spend some time with Christ. Let him jar you out of your comfort zone. Don't let Christ be amazed by your lack of faith. See him in a new light with fresh eyes and great, big expectations. The disciples followed Jesus to his hometown. The second part of this text tells us that he sent them out two by two and gave them authority. Now let's think about that for a minute. Jesus gave them authority. They cast out unclean spirits and healed many. Jesus shared his power and authority with them. Do we often feel, each one of us, that we have the power of Jesus? I would say probably not, but by the gift of the Holy Spirit, Jesus sends us out with power and authority. We each have power and authority from Christ. We don't think of ourselves as powerful, but that is our misconception. Jesus promised in John 14, he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will do all the works that I do, and greater works than these he will do, because I am going to the Father. And the first word in that phrase in John is everyone. Everyone, which means all of us. Not some people, not most people, not just the disciples, will do excuse me, great things. There are no limits on what we can do if we have faith in Christ. Do we have that kind of faith? We talked last week about everything being possible with God. The problem was believing that that was actually true. This week, this week I'm talking about doing things greater than Jesus did. How can God have such a high opinion, have such a high opinion of little old us? God can have that opinion because God created us, each and every one of us. God has confidence in our faith, and we usually look at faith from the other perspective, that we have faith in God. But God, too, has faith in us, just as Jesus had faith in sending out those disciples two by two. Adam and Eve were the first people to mess up and do the one thing God told them not to do. Each generation has followed in their footsteps. But God knows what will happen. God knows what we will do. And nothing takes God by surprise because God is the God of the past, the present, and the future. God knows everything that has happened and the things that will happen. Yet God has enough faith in your faith to allow Jesus, his one and only Son, to go through terrible agony and die so that we might spend 
eternity with God. God wants you. No matter who you are. And when we think about all of our imperfections, it comes as a shock that God would want us, and not only would want us, would want to be with us forever. As I have told you before, it boggles my mind to think that God might want me to hang around Him forever. Yet God's faith in people is that strong. God's faith in you is that strong. God has given us the power to make changes in this world so that we can move this world toward the kingdom of God. That's our job as we go out two by two, as we let the same old thing go and embrace the possibilities. Now, think about it. Imagine those disciples when Jesus sent them out. They were probably scared, not confident, and may not have believed Jesus. Yet it came time for the birds to fly from the nest. It was time for the disciples to internalize the fact that God has faith in them. God had faith in the disciples. And as well, it's time for each one of us to internalize our faith. They were... Uh, it is time to be blessed this day that God has given you the power to share His love. God has given you the strength to go out. God knows that some will not be open to the message that God has given. God knows that there will be challenging times. But God has the faith in you to face them and come out undeterred. He had such faith in the disciples that He told them not to take anything that they would normally take on a journey. Their faith was all they needed to bring. I have the same message for you. When you go out, when you go out of these doors, have faith in you. Have the same faith that God has in you. That faith is all you need. It is enough. Let us close with a prayer by Ted Loader. O oh God of beginnings, as your spirit moved over the face of the deep on the first day of creation, move with me now in my time of beginnings. When the air is rainwashed and the bloom is on the bush and the world seems fresh and full of possibilities, and I feel ready and full. I tremble on the edge of maybe a first time, a new thing, a tentative start, and the wonder of it lays its fingers on my lips. In silence, Lord, I share now my eagerness and my uneasiness about the something different that I would be or do. And I listen for your leading to help me separate the light from the darkness in the change I seek to shape and which is shaping me. Amen. south, the east, and the west. Come and feed yourselves on God's gift to each one of us. Now, this is going to be different than we've done in the last couple of years, or the last year and a half, so have patience. When you get the bread or the cracker, take and eat it first. Because, and right when you get it, because this symbolizes that God loves you alone. Let us now sing all glory, Lord, and Lord and honor, page 196. <laughs>
Please be seated. On that night, so long ago, Jesus took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Ministering to you in his name, I give you the bread. And as I said, when you get it, take and eat, because this is the bread of life. say your statement of faith found in the bulletins. So remain seated and let us say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and dead and buried. This is a sign of the new covenant. 
This is the sign that I will never leave you. Ministering to you in his name, I give you the cup. And when you get it, hold on, and we shall all drink together, because this group is important to God. our salvation comes from Christ. <clears throat> and let us together say the prayer of thanksgiving found in the bulletins. God of grace, we give you thanks for the feast of redemption that we have shared body and blood of our Savior. As you have nourished us with love, let our lives proclaim your great love for the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Are there any prayer requests today? Jay Monty. I say again, please. Jay Monty.
We can't forget Toot. We can't forget uh, Lori Sluffle. We can't forget Sadie. Any others? Well then, let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for letting us say thank you to you, for allowing us to be your children, for allowing us to be loved by you. Lord, you give such gifts. Help us to notice them. Help us to smell the clean, fresh air, to perhaps go out in our bare feet and touch the grass, to hear the birds chirping and know that all of this is a gift of yours to us. Lord, bless this place and bless Dale Inman, bless Timmy Sanders, bless Butch Brigham, Bigham and his wife, bless Robert Bolin, the Harris family, and Jay Mundy, and Toot, and Lori Suffolk, and Sadie. And bless them all with this prayer that your son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> Are there any announcements today? Bible school coming up July the 17th. So we think we have a plan, but we may be still asking for volunteers. Or if you would like to volunteer, talk to Jesse. That's July 17th. Um, this is the first Sunday of the month. We usually have a... a session meeting this this day, but we're not going to do it today. We'll have session again in August. Any other announcements? Okay then, let us take our morning offering. <laughs>
Go forth from this place. Go forth in joy, because God shows his love each and every day. Help us to show God's love to a hurting world. Amen. Amen.